Good morning. Here we are, seniors, day five. But before I talk about day five, first of all, a shout out to our four presenters yesterday. Anna Eastep told us how to have wonder and gratitude and also ingenuity in front of nature. And after that, Nia implored us to take a positive view and not a nihilistic one and continue to make things that communicate and are beautiful. And after that, Rudy, told us that there are things light years away that are inspiring and interesting to know about. And after that, Avila talked about how we are probably all connected with all of nature in the spirit world. And after that, Avila's father spoke in the Irish language right here in CWS Auditorium, and I thought that's as good as this day is gonna get. <laughs> but that was yesterday. Today, here we are, day five, and we have Two more presentations which come last but are certainly not least. We have Nick Solano and Arwen Gaffar this morning. And before I bring them up here, I want to say a few thank yous on behalf of the high school and the school in general. First of all, I want to thank all of the parents of our seniors and the families that are here gathered or watching uh, on the streaming service. It is always, it always feels a privilege to teach your, your I almost called them children, your students, uh, but never so much as in a week where we've seen so many amazing things as we have thus far. And I wanna thank those, yes, go ahead, round of applause for your parents. I want to shout out to the parent volunteers that have been stealthily working in the background all week. KT and Sheila and Catherine and Dana and Lara, thank you parents for all the little things that make this week go by so magically and wonderfully. I would like to thank all of the uh, faculty sponsors, I mean uh, faculty advisors to our seniors. I know that they're not the ones that are up here on stage garnering your an admiration and applause, but they worked pretty hard. Uh, Monse Aguero, Tony Bellagamba, Catherine Rogers, Kurt Eatstep, Whitney Blakemore, Dolph Paulson, Jude Gonzalez, Sarah Wellington, Matthew Jeanette, Cynthia Von Orthal, thank you teachers for working with the students on these senior projects. Also, thank you to our technical crew. We have Colin Williams from Ambient Sound with his assistants, Casey and Chris, who set up the streaming. They were here for a long time on Sunday getting ready for this thing. So thank you to Ambient Sound. <laughs> and to our sound man on loan from Blue Man Group, John Hochtel. Thank you, John. And hardly least of all, the two that really put this together and kept it put together all week, even when it looked like it might fray around the edges, Emily Beefies and Monse Aguero. Thank you, class, senior sponsors. All right, and so now please welcome my colleague, Curdy, step to the stage. Good morning, everyone. That was good. Okay. <laughs> so I am here to introduce Nick to everyone. Uh, if uh, dear 12th grade, if you remember, again, all the way back to ninth grade, I, my first memory of Nick was uh, I was thrown into a study hall or you know some some type of casual studying situation with Nick. I don't quite remember, but. 
I was tasked with correcting some of Nick's writing. And, uh, so I, and I didn't know Nick at all. And Nick was, in my mind, Nick was about this tall, then, but had great hair. Uh, um, and I remember the, the paragraph that he had written was about his favorite cars. And I was kept trying to tell him, you know, this is a comma splice, this is a fragment. And he kept trying to say, yeah, 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 but what is your favorite car, Mr. Easton? <laughs> I don't think he quite understood why I was there. It was, it, he kept trying to ask me what my favorite car is, and I, I refrained from giving my thrilling answer a 2016 Honda Odyssey. He <laughs> but uh, that, that has been his very deep interest in a lot of different developing ways ever since ninth grade. Uh, and we started this process together discussing uh, Greek mythology. Uh, Nick was especially taken by certain aspects of the Iliad and the Odyssey when we read that together. And he, for a while, was really interested in somehow doing that as a senior project. And, but I have to say, as we figured out in the end of our 12th grade English class, Nick is a master practitioner of karma yoga, which is practical work in the world. So he returned with much more enthusiasm, finally realizing that, yes, this is the right decision to talk about engines, how they work, how to build them, and what their history was. Uh, with all sorts of intentions behind this, wanting to build an engine in the future, wanting to understand how they work, and wanting to understand where the technology came from. Uh, we can't really underestimate how important those ideas are to understand an engine that we depend on every single day. So Nick's project comes from that perspective, that he wants to understand the world not just in a bookish classroom sense, but to contribute to that understanding through real, real work. So that is our focus when we started to have long conversations and about what this project would be, and that really has turned into a lovely uh, piece of history and technological uh, information that everyone should be fascinated in with because we are all dependent on engines every single day. Uh, so what he has come up with is really, I hope, is a way to uh, allow everyone to enter into what the technology of an engine is, even if we are totally ignorant of it. We should all want to do that. So uh, <clears throat> that is the end product. And he has done it very well, very enthusiastically too. The, the puzzle has been solved, I think, by Nick uh, in determining what he can best do in his senior project. Uh, this is a, a lovely presentation. Again, I said it at the beginning, all of these projects have been so different and all, all coming from the heart in some very special way and unique way for each of our students. And this is absolutely no exception. So to introduce you to the technology of the engine and the developmental history, of the engine. Let me introduce Nick Alexander Solano. Hello, um, my name is Nick Solano, as you heard. Uh, I'll be talking about the developmental history of the engine. First, I'd like to start off with a quote by Rudolf Steiner. Uh, Rudolf Steiner said in a lecture in 1922, to use modern technology with no knowledge of how things work or how they were made is like being a prisoner in a cell without windows through which one could at least look into nature and to freedom. The engine is a mystery to most people even in modern day, even though it's been around for thousands of years. The word engine comes from the, word, from the Latin word ingenium, which means talent device. Also, the word motor, which comes from the Latin word motor, which means mover or driver. The first working engine was built in the first century by an architect. Then after that came gas engines and electric engines. What I'm going to be talking about is how these technolo technological advancements were made, how they came to be, and how they happened. The reason I am so intrigued in this topic is because I've always been fascinated with cars the main thing that sparked my interest, no pun intended, <laughs> was a movie series called Fast and the Furious, where they would have many different cars with modifications and specs to make them go faster and with cool designs. 
Ever since I watched the movie series, I've wanted to build and modify and design my own car, but I'm still not knowledgeable enough to do so. The research that I'm going to be providing helped me understand more about how key parts, of, key parts in the engine work, which will one day help me complete my goal when, uh, to build my own engine and model and design my own car. Here is the first steam engine. Uh, the first steam engine was invented by an architect named Var Marcus Vitruvius Polio, known as the Heer Alexandria, a Greek-Egyptian uh, uh, mathematician. He was known for his book of architecture. A lot of his plans were, were used and well-known, and he wanted his name to be known for generations. Most of the wall paintings in Roman construction were Vitruvius' work. Even though it was unacknowledged, he was known for his work to be the chief authority on ancient classical architecture. He, f he created the first steam engine as a steam turbine model and created his book of architecture. This will be a surprise to most how early the first steam engine was made. Uh, the steam turbine was used as a party trick and mere curiosity. The turbine is just a kettle and a hollow sphere connected and the sphere has angled tubes coming out of it and out, and out of it. Under the kettle is a fire and the kettle is filled with water which causes the steam to build up in the sphere and the pressure of the steam shoots out of the tubes which causes it to rotate. This picture shows the steam turbine that Vitruvius made. The way it works is there's water in the kettle and the fire is built under it and there are two pipes connected to the kettle. The pipes are also connected to a hollow sphere with two angled tubes coming out of it. The water heats up, which causes pressure, and the pressure causes the wheel to spin because of all the steam built up. Next is the turbine engine. The difference between a turbine engine, a turbine and an engine is that a turbine is a machine, not complex. On the other hand, the engine has multiple turbines, but also has a lot of other parts and is always in motion until turned off. An engine turns fuel into movement, a turbine turns movement into heat and energy. Vitruvius spinning sphere was fueled by the fire and that heated the water to produce steam. The sphere acted like a turbine that would spin by the motion of the steam flowing through it. The jets of the steam coming out of the tubes caused the motion which made the sphere spin. Even though this was an impressive invention 2,000 years ago, it did not produce power or extra energy that could be used for other purposes. It took more than 1,600 years before burning fuel was used to power a machine. Next. I'll be talking to Thomas Savory Coal Pump. Then comes the first engine, which is the first coal pump. It was invented by Thomas Savory in 1698. It was called an engine at the time, but this was different from how it was, we used it, the word today. Engine back then just meant a device. The Savory pump was used in Britain for coal mining because the deeper they went, they struggled to get coal due to the water levels being so high. Savory invented a solution. His solution was making a pump to get the water out. After he invented it, the mining companies mined 80% of the coal in Europe. The Savory pump had no moving parts except the valves that were closed or open during the pumping process. It used pressure of the steam to push water up and out of the top of the mine. It was very inefficient and broke easily, but it was a major advancement to machines and was also the first machine to to use burning fuel to generate power to, com to accomplish uh, an industrial job. Here is the savory pump. Uh, the Thomas Savory pump works by heating water to vaporize it, filling the tank with steam, then create a vacuum by isolating the tank from the steam source and condensing the steam, which causes suction. Next is the Thomas Newcomen engine. In 1712, Thomas Newcomen made a better steam engine. By changing the design, he added a cylinder and a piston that would rise and lower. Steam would go into the cylinder, making low pressure. Cool water was then added, which made the steam condense. When the steam condensed, it made a vacuum inside the cylinder, which pulled the piston down to balance the air pressure inside and outside. It was called an atmospheric engine because it needed air pressure outside the machine to push the pistons down by separating the piston and condensing water, it was making the steam engine more efficient, unlike the savory pump. Newcomen's invention had moving parts. It was the first steam engine used for mechanical work. His design was used all over Britain to pump water out of coal mines, and it used to mine. It was used to mine deeper, which helped 
mine a lot of corn britain he wasn't the only one there was also thomas savory before him but thomas newcomen improved it to work faster which helped the mining coal coal mining go quicker next is james watt in 1765 james watt made additions to the new common engine by adding a separate condenser. Condenser is to not have the heating or cooling the cylinder with each stroke. It saved a lot of energy to not have to reheat the cylinder after every stroke of the pistons. The cylinder that supplied the steam was always hot. Now, there was no wait time in between strokes. His engine did not have an up and down motion. It had a rotating shaft and he always added many other improvements to produce a power, he also added many other improvements to produce a, pack, a practical power plant. Next is Richard Trevithick. Richard Trevithick experimented with high pressure steams to improve moving parts of a machine. He helped the technology moving past atmospheric pressure uh, outside the machine to make pistons go down. This was possible because of the improvements in the ways people made pipes and boilers. Before this time, the metal pipes couldn't handle as much pressure, but now they could. Trevor Thick was the first person in England to use a steam carriage on railway systems in 1803. He also built steam locomotives, vehicles that had a successful run with the horse car in 1804. Next, John Henry Corliss. He was a manufacturer of the Corliss steam engine. He made many improvements to the engine, uh, which was the Corliss valve, which had separate inlet and exhaust ports, and he introduced springs to the speed of opening and closing valves. The engine was enormous and made many more factories possible around the world, speeding up the Industrial Revolution. Next is John Stevens. In 1803, he built the first American steamboat, Little Juliana. It, used, it was used to navigate the Hudson River. Stevens also requested patents for his inventions to not be stolen by other people. Unlike steamships today, Juliana had a screw propeller, which looked like the drill on an oil rig instead of a fan blade propeller ships have now. The boat was small and could only take a few passengers. Commercial ferries were being successfully, successfully operated a few years later. The early steamboats of the early 1800s all used new common engines. The first com combustion engine was used gunpowder, which was used as a method to cause a vacuum in the cylinder. And Hugens figured out later on that it was also hazardous because gunpowder was very explosive and would blow up most engines. Hugens' first gunpowder engine was built in 1680. How it worked was gunpowder was inserted into the tube, into a tube and lit at the base of the cylinder like a cannon right there. Uh, lighting the powder from the outside is what it makes it different from later on combustion from from later on combustion engines called internal combustion engines. The pressure of the gunpowder being lit pushes the piston down up to the top of the cylinder, and then holes are revealed and releases the hot gases. When the gases escape, the pressure in the cylinder decreases. The weight of the piston and the vacuum caused by the cylinder so by the cylinder cooling and and lowering the pressure inside pulls the piston back down to the bottom of the cylinder. The combustion engine is like a cannon, but instead of letting the cannonball fly, it is stopped last second and is sucked back into the cannon, which is somewhat makes it a combustion engine. Hugens' first gunpowder engine was similar to the savory pump. It also used the difference in pressure to power the down, power the down motion of the piston. Also like the savory pumps, it could not be fired repeatedly. The downstroke of the piston was very powerful, and there were famous demonstrations where Hugens showed lifting eight boys up into the air, and uh, also needed a new fuel type because the pistons did not rotate fully and needed more of a powerful internal force to rotate the pistons. The fire piston. Also, in 100 AD in Southeast Asia, there was something called the fire piston. It was a piece of kindle and is rapidly ignited by the gases around it, aka air. The way it works is you put a piece of kindle on top of the wood, and this piece of wood is inserted into a cylinder, but the top is open to insert the piece of wood, and the bottom is covered. Then you insert the piece of wood that has the kindle on top, and you insert it a little bit, and then smack the piece of wood down, 
and then pull it out quickly, which causes spark through the compression of air. This invention had an influence on how diesel engines work. Diesel engines do not use spark plugs like gasoline engines. They use a compressed air spark, which ignites, which causes the engine to start. Oil was first discovered in China in 600 BC and was transported in pipelines made of bamboo. The Chinese also used to transport natural gas, oil, and heat. The Chinese used bamboo to transport it into their homes and places where it was needed. The Chinese used oil and gas as fuel for light and heat, but not for mechanical power. One way it was used, it was to use to evaporate salt water, leaving the salt behind. In the United States, oil was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 1859 by a Colonel Edwin Drake, and then in Texas in 1901, the spindle top discovery. The spindle top discovery was, uh, set the stage for an oil economy in the United States. The spindle top discovery was when a geyser of oil erupted in the spindle tops hills uh, in Texas, and the oil shot up up to 50, 150 feet high, as shown in the picture, and was said to produce over 100,000 barrels a day. Oil was being used in cars was the idea of Dr. John W. Ellis. Dr. John, he was one of the founders of Valvoline. It was first started as a research plan to research crude oil and its properties working in the mechanical field. However, his research plan was to research crude oil and its properties working in the mechanical field. However, his research fell short due to it not having the properties that it needed for medicinal use. but he discovered later on that it was a great lubricant for machines. When he discovered it, he was told by his wife's sister's husband, Ezekiel Crocker Leonard, uh, who was in the oil refinery industry, and his refinery company was failing. Dr. John W. Ellis saw the opportunity to share his discovery with the world. Dr. Ellis helped Leonard, and they came together to help his, his company. They founded the famous Valvoline Company, which flourished flourished in its time, becoming one of the most popular oil companies in the world. Ellis was not the first to discover oil, but was the first to expand it into a company to make it globally known that it, it was a great lubricant for machines everywhere. Oil is not only used for lubricating the engine, but in some engines it was used to power the engine as an igniter. Oil goes through a big process, getting refined to be suitable to be used in cars. The way it is refined is by taking out all the water and unwanted materials through distillation with different temperatures, which make many different fuels that we use every day in the world. The three steps to properly refine oil is to boil it at a certain temperature, which causes the liquids to evaporate. Next is cracking the oil. Cracking the oil is when you break big molecules into smaller molecules which is a key step to refining it, which includes reshaping it and combining it. The final step is to move all the unnecessary chemicals and contaminants. Oil can be made into many different uh, fuels, which are liquefied petroleum, chemicals, petrol for cars, jet fuel and paraffin for heating devices, diesel fuels, lubricating oils, waxes, polishes, and fuels for ships and industrial processes, and tar and butamin for roofs of the sh and streets. The first combustion was made in 1794 by Thomas Mead. Also in 1794, the first internal combustion engine was made by Robert Street. He proposed coal, tar, and spirit, and turpentine, which are all gaseous, and then ignited by a flame, which is outside of the cylinder, which would cause a piston weight to move down, and then the combustion. Before the four-stroke engine, there were attempts to make an engine to be used in vehicles and transfer people where they needed to go and stop using horse carriages. Many attempts led up to the four-stroke engine, which led to, which led to all improvements by inventors one after another to get an engine that could be reliable, which led to the first four-stroke engine which was made in 1876 by Nicholas August Otto. A four-stroke engine is an engine that uses four pistons to complete a process in the engine. 
it had a limited amount of power, but it's, it still worked to go from point A to point B. The technological advancements in the cars have exceeded most expectations, but not all. Engines that were used today are more efficient than the engines that were made 100 to 200 years ago. The modern, tech, the modern engine has technology that, will not, that most will not comprehend and has been advanced to hybrid switching between gas and electric. The engine does not weigh as much and some have fewer parts that do not, and also parts that do not break easily and last longer and are smaller and produce, still produce a lot of power. Many people assume by 2024 there would be flying cars, where it may be the case that there are some attempts of people trying to make it happen, but those attempts are not known to many people, and their main focus in the car manufacturing industry is to make the best electric car and who can sell the most and make their sales go up and making the car faster and nicer. I'll be going to the manufacturers of uh, I'll be going to the earliest car manufacturers and how they started. Some of these companies are commonly known, which shows the evolution of how hard at work and dedication of, to their line of work. First is Panhard and Leviser. They were a manufacturing company made by a couple who first started making gas engines, turning them into automobiles. Then in World War II, they made machinery for the French army. They started in 18. 98, when the company was official and quickly started manufacturing gas engines. During the Great War, their company was asked to the military, by the military to produce vehicles for them, which is a huge success for them. But due to illness, Panhard did not make it to see the company succeed, but the company flourished in 2004. When they were bought out by another company that outshined them in the manufacturing industry. Next is Peugeot. Peugeot was made by a group of brothers who owned a metal business and then had the ideas of making cars, which helped them, which helped because it was a family-owned business. They already had metal for it. They already started building velocipedes and quadricycles. Right here you see the velocipede and this would be a quadricycle. The difference between them is the amount of wheels they have. Uh, the velocipede has three wheels and the quadricycle has four. Um, by 1829, they introduced the Peugeot 201, which was a nice vehicle for its time. The company also made motorized scooters, which became very popular in 1953 when they were mass produced due to the increasing sale rates. Next, everybody knows Carl Benz. Carl Benz was the f made the first reliable engine. It was a two-stroke engine that was built in 1879. They became an official company of Benz & Co. Later on, they merged with Dahmer, Dahmer, ben, da, with Dahmer Motor Company and created Dahmer Benz in 1926, which is the maker of the vehicle Mercedes-Benz. Next is Charles and Frank Duria. Charles and Frank Duria uh, were the first men to manufacture a car and put it in the market in the United States of America. The way they started was when they saw a station area that seemed to be able to power a carriage and from then on made designs and blueprints to find a way to fit the engine in the carriage to make it move and drive people around. In 1891, he finished the, the model and then started making the car. The car worked, but it was not that fast and only had four horsepower. But even though it had a little horsepower, he began to win a lot of races and was known for having the fastest vehicle. Next is Ford. Ford's first car hit the market, and it was called the Model T Ford. It was a very popular car because, it was, because the car was made for every class of people. It was affordable for everyone, not just the wealthy people. First, the car was only at a price for the wealthy people, but after selling about 10,000 vehicles, uh, he said to the people that they could get a Model S or a Model R, and they could get it for free as long as it was the color black. And that was a publicity stunt that worked well for his company. Ford wanted his employees to be able to afford the Model T Ford so people could see it drive around and attract people to buy his car. Next is Ferrari. Enzo Ferrari was a big car enthusiast. He started driving for Alfa Romero, testing cars, and before that worked for other companies. His hard work paid off and Alfa Romero put the racing team in his hands. And Ferrari also, 
which gave Ferrari the idea to make his own racing team due to Alfa Romero not taking the racing team seriously, which, um, which made him make his uh, team a few years later and making his first car in 1947, which is right here, the Ferrari 125S. People may say, this change is for the better for the environment, but it still has the same effect on the environment. Electric vehicles require rare earth metals, as you'll see here, uh, but which are materials found in the Earth's crust, refining these materials so they can be used as products cause a ton of, a ton of toxic waste. Even in factories or a car it produces claims to be carbon neutral in terms of using fossil fuels, it still impacts the environment and is even worse in the end. Marketing gives people the idea that cars, electric cars are better for the environment. It makes it, it, makes it easy to make people think this way because not many people consider life of the car beyond the time they own it and drive it. But every car is connected to an entire life cycle. And that has to be considered before making conclusions about the level of environmental damage or benefit. The batteries used in some of these cars are made with energy from fossil fuels. The energy to charge these batteries mostly come through the normal power grid, which still uses fossil fuels. This is my opinion, but electric vehicles are just as bad as electric vehicles. Because of how they are made, they are also dangerous because you cannot hear them coming if they go past the stop sign and you're crossing the street. From my experience, many cars that are electric do not know how to properly stop at a stop sign, which is why I always end up getting hit by a car, and which also, I can't react fast enough because you can't hear them coming. And then next would be nuclear engines. The nuclear engine was a harmful engine, which is first used by causing a mass amount of radiation to be released into the plane or submarine that was being used and causing the people on board to get sick and also get cancer and die. After many years of trying different things, they proceeded to start realizing how much actual metals and radiation, how actual metals keep radiation in. They needed keep radiation in. In current times, they use over 100 tons of lead just to keep the radiation in and keep the people on the ship safe. Now these engines are fully functional without any errors and can last 30 years or more without refueling. But they do not need to go to land to, rest they need to, go to land to restock on water and food supplies which are needed for the crew members. And I'll be going back to the first submarine. The first submarine dates back to 1620. The submarine is used for, mil for the military, but the first engine that was used was humans and oars made by Cornelius Drebbel. Since they couldn't make an engine, they just used people and wooden oars to get the submarine moving underwater. There are many different inventions of the submarine, like the turtle. The turtle was the next submarine David Bushnell invented. The engine that the turtle had was two screw propellers, one on the top and the other in the front. Both of these screw propellers were turned manually by the person inside. Now, to my conclusion. My conclusion is the the engines took a while to develop, but they succeeded after years of hard work and now being the most used mode of transportation. But still many people do not know enough about cars, which brings me back to my quote. Rudolf Steiner said in lecture to use modern technology with no knowledge of how things work or how they are made is like being a prisoner in a cell without windows through which one could at least look into nature and to freedom. Another thing is, Another thing is the effect vehicles have on the environment, and I hope you now understand how much electric vehicles actually impact the environment. My hope is that we continue to develop more and more and truly sustainable energies. The end? <laughs> Thank you.
now for my thank yous. I'd like to thank Mr. Eastup for always pushing me to do my work and believing in me. Next is Ms. Hasenbegovic. Ms. Hasenbegovic, thank you for the talk we had when I was supposed to be in Eurythmy, <laughs> which made me change my mind and do something I was really passionate about. Next is Ms. Wellington. Thank you for always being there for me and the talks you had and pushing me to do well. Next is Mr. Paulson. Thank you for all the help you've given me and always cheered me up with all your jokes. And thank you to the boys, Seamus, Cindy, and Rudy for everything, all the support you guys gave for me. And finally, thank you to my class for being so supportive and welcoming. And also, shout out to Protein Paradise. <laughs> Go flying up, Nick. Yes. Well, we have our standard first question from Naya here. Yeah. Nick, I learned so much about engines and cars in that time. I wanted to ask, since you were talking about sustainable cars and how you hate EVs, I do too. Uh, how do you feel about hydrogen fuel cells and uh, hydrogen as a source of fuel? Do you still prefer gas, or do you think that could be the future? Um. I, do, I did look into hydrogen cells being used in vehicles. Um, they're also kind of like um, electric vehicles because they, hydrogen cell cars also use electricity. Um, yeah, I mean, I still prefer gas. Yes, Bailey. What is your favorite car? As you see right here is the R34 Skyline. Uh, it is a Japanese vehicle. Uh, I just love the way it sounds and the way it looks. And it is uh, the famous car of Paul Walker, my favorite uh, actor from the series Fast and the Furious. Um, well, really good presentation. Um, mine is very similar to Bailey, but what's your favorite car from the Fast and Furious saga, like presented in the movie? Oh, I'd say mm, the Toyota Supra. Here. Fantastic job. Thank you for the shout out. Um, um, what do you think <laughs> of those cars nowadays that like fully turn off and then turn on? You know the new ones yeah. that do that? What yeah. do you think of that? I think uh, that being that happening in the engine is bad for the engine, but um, after time it still works, but it is still bad for the engine for it to be stopping and then starting again. Yes, Jaden. Okay, but what's your favorite supercar? Favorite supercar? Um, <laughs> I'd say uh, the Koenigsegg Yesco. <laughs> the Koenigsegg Yesco? Uh, Nick, I have a question. Um, oh, there you go. Great presentation. I appreciate that. As someone who loves engines, motors, and things that go, I, I can appreciate what you did. I was wondering about the quote and this notion that people should know how it works. Um, what do you think about the possibility of teaching people about how their car works so that it runs more efficiently? That's my first question. And then my second one is really like, what do you have against American muscle cars? <laughs> um, Teaching people how to use a car properly and how to maintain it properly. I would love to teach people. I would love to, for people to get taught that. Uh, but I wouldn't go into that field. I'd like to more work with cars. And then I do not have anything against muscle cars because my second favorite car is a Dodge Hellcat Charger. So I have nothing against muscle cars. <laughs> Good job, Nick. I'm wondering if you would ever go in a submarine if you got the chance. No. Okay. <laughs> hey, Nick. Uh, beautiful work back here. Sorry. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. I got to give you a little bit of a hard time on EVs, though. Uh, I can't let that slide. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, extraction of rare earth minerals can be environmentally rough, but what about the extraction of oil from the earth? What do you think, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so the extraction of oil from the earth also causes a lot of pollution, but uh, 
EVs, their batteries that are using EV engines, also take hundreds of years to disintegrate into the earth. So I think there's still like still a little controversy with that. Do you watch any motorsports? Uh, no, I do not. <laughs> What's your favorite hypercar? Hypercar. Um, I'd go for the Bugatti Chiron Motorsport. Um, sorry, I forgot what my question was. All right, we'll pass it on here. Nick, um, I know you love your bicycle just as much as anything powered by uh, a, a, a combustion engine. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think that, because I know you're, you're so interested in um, souped up cars, uh, are they, is the future of the personal automobile something for pleasure and entertainment? Or what, what do you think about urban transportation? What should we be doing? Um, I think gas cars are good. <laughs> um, <laughs> can you repeat the question? <laughs> Is the future of cars just for fun, um, primarily for fun? Or do you think that individuals sh should continue driving gas-powered vehicles, especially in crowded cities where the roads are not open uh, and most of the time is spent idling. Okay, I understand that. Um, so, um, uh, my on my side, uh, the gas-powered engine is more for pure entertainment for me personally, but um, yeah. That's how I feel about it. Um, what's your favorite engine design? Engine design, um, I'd go for the regular V8 engine, um, but I did hear there is a V12 engine being processed and manufactured. Uh, have you seen the movie Ford versus Ferrari? Yes, I have. It's a great movie. Uh, my question is, uh, what, so you said that electric vehicles are bad for the environment. You also said that you weren't sure about the hydrogen-powered gas. What do you think, uh, do you have like any sort of ideas as to what sort of sustainable fuel sources that we could use, or like sustainable engines and stuff? <sighs> um, I mean, there's also uh, fuel cell cars that, uh, I've uh, also learned about uh, they're a reliable source, but they're also like electric cars, but they use uh, fuel cells, which is uh, man-made uh, that we make. Um, I think that's also like a sustainable source of energy, but it still use it still uses it's still used as an electric vehicle. Nick, great job. Um, What's your input on water running cars? Do you think it's gonna become a like a thing? And is it like good for the environment if it does become a thing? So with water running cars, um, the water would evaporate too quickly for it to go a certain amount of uh, time, a certain amount of miles. So I think it would be a good thing to happen, but the way it would work is you'd have to refuel it constantly. And which, um, I th it would be a good thing, but it's just hard to maintain. Fantastic presentation, Nick. <laughs> I loved it. It was amazing. I learned so much. But I was left with two questions. Uh, one being, what is the difference between a uh, like a manual, like a stick shift, and automatic car? Okay, so the difference between manual and automatic is the switching of the gears. <laughs> Manual cars, you switch the gears manually, and then automatic, the gears switch automatically. Most people, most most people's opinions, um, automatic cars are easy to drive, but manuals are more difficult. But um, the automatic switching of the gears is, um, people think that it's bad for the engine. And my personal opinion, I'd rather drive a manual than an automatic, because you really feel the torque in the car. 
All right, and uh, m my second question is, uh, I know you said you like Hellcast. Uh, what about SRTs? Uh, <laughs> Hellcast SRT? <laughs> uh, the SRT is different than the Hellcat, so I prefer the Hellcat. Uh, what's your favorite, like, what do you think the best color car is? The best color car? Yeah. Um, so, uh, my personal opinion in the cars that I've looked at to this day is, uh, like, the space gray looks really cool in the car, and then sometimes the color blue. What's your favorite Tesla? I hate Teslas. <laughs> <laughs> few things. Number one, <laughs> I'm fine with Tesla, I just don't like Elon Musk, okay? Just and then, would you rather have a Mac or no, an Aston Martin Valkyrie or a McLaren P1? Mm. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. I think the Aston Martin Valkyrie looks really cool. But when it comes to speed, I'd go with the McLaren P1. Uh, <laughs> development. Where do you think we end up getting with both like efficiency and top speed in vehicles, especially personal vehicles? And then do you see a future where with technology we don't yet have, there are fully efficient, no emissions vehicles that still operate at the capacity and style that our current gas and petrol vehicles can operate at? Um, I, th I think we could uh, reach that level um, in the future. Uh, I feel like we can make that car electric, but the way that we would get the electricity to power the battery would be uh, using less fossil fuels, and that's what I hope for. Um, I'm Hi. right here. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on public transportation? Uh, I think public, public transportation is good. I mean, because most people will not have a car um, due to this uh, bad economy. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think public transportation is good. It does use a lot of uh, fuel, but it's the way people get around. Hi. Over here. Uh, I have two questions. Do you like motorcycles? Yes. What's your favorite motorcycle? All right. So I've been looking into motorcycles so far because um, uh, I really want one. Uh, I want to get a Ninja Kawasaki 400 as my first because... <laughs> I didn't get to finish. Hi. Good job. My question is, what do you think about the accuracy of the Fast and Furious movies, and what's your favorite Fast and Furious movie? All right, the accuracy in the movies is, for the cars in general, the way they move and maneuver in the movie is pretty factual. Uh, but the storyline's sometimes a little weird, I'd say. Um, and my favorite would be Fast and Furious 6 because of, uh, because of a line uh, uh, the Rock said to uh, Roman Pierce in the movie. It was very funny. <laughs> are, are you going to say what the line is? What was that? Are you going to say what the line is that was? I don't. Line? I don't remember personally. Oh wait, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. If I give me a second. Uh, oh, it uses curse words. I, I, I don't want to. Thank, thank you. Okay. I don't want to endanger right. myself here. <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question over here. Yeah. Um, like, uh, what sort of car would you base um, your car off of if you wanted to make it? I'd base my car off of the R34 Skyline, as you see here. Um, as you see the engine there, it's all souped up, has modifications. Um, yeah, I want to base it off that. <laughs> okay, everyone, we need to take a brief break. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. Excellent work.
So it is 10.50. I believe we will start at 11. So we have 10 minutes for a break starting now. We'll be back.
Is somebody introducing you? Please take your seats. waiting for Omar, is he just figuring something out? He's talking to Chris. <laughs> oh, is he still in the back? Okay, you good? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and um, it's been such a great week, and we're going to finish our week with the final presentation that is just going to complete this whole week with uh, beauty and fun and, uh, I think, a call to action, so that will be pretty neat. Um, hang on one sec. This glass thing. All right. I'm Sarah Wellington, and it has been my great pleasure and honor to serve as Arwen Gaffar's Senior Project Advisor. So during drama class in the fall of 2020, do you all remember that? When half of the then ninth grade students, uh, half of them were learning at home, and half of them were attending in person, I led the class in what I called an exercise of appreciation. I don't know if you guys remember this. <laughs> so each student shared an observation anonymously about something they admired or appreciated in each of the others. In speaking of Arwen, one classmate wrote, Arwen holds strong beliefs and is a powerful person. I feel she's going a lot of places in life. While another observed, Arwen is someone who encourages others. Though the class had been together only a few short weeks at the time, the bright fire that burns within Arwen was clearly visible. During that same period, the presidential election of 2020 was mere weeks away. And Arwen, deeply committed to the electoral process, 
as she has been for all of her life, and you will get to see that, served as an election judge at 14 years old. Theater is the other passion that has consumed Arwen throughout her life. She has an acting resume as long as your arm, because when one show is coming to an end, she's already readying herself for the next. Peter Brook, the visionary theater director, once said, the meaning of a theater event is that none of us could see something so clearly as with the new energy that is brought with the meeting of a theme, actors living it, and an audience gradually entering it to live it with them. At that moment, a certain light appears, revealing what we would never have thought of on our own. In Arwen's presentation, you will hear the story of how she blended two burning passions to make a piece of theater that seeks to question assumptions, challenge perceived powerlessness, and forge hope for the future. Creating something out of nothing is a nourishing act for the art makers and audience members alike. For her senior project, Arwen set out with a lofty purpose to write, cast, produce, and direct a play which might provoke introspection, inspire action, and offer hope in this election year and beyond. Please welcome Arwen Gaffar to the stage. Hi everyone, my name is Arwen. For my senior project, I chose to explore theater as a form of activism. I wrote, directed, and designed a one-act play called Strike, Spark, Ignite. Strike, Spark, Ignite follows four characters who have found themselves outside a burning house at a loss for how to help. These characters grapple with feelings of frustration and powerlessness and eventually find their way to hope. Voting as Fire Extinguisher by Kyle Tranmeyer. When the haunted house catches fire, a moment of indecision. The house was, after all, built on bones and blood and bad intentions. Everyone who enters the house feels that overwhelming dread, the evil that perhaps only fire can purge. It's tempting to just let it burn. And then I remember, there are children inside. Those are the words this whole project began with. Voting as fire extinguisher is part of a longer poem called To Throw a Wrench in the Blood Machine, which talks about voting using several different metaphors. I saved the poem Voting as Fire Extinguisher about two years ago and stumbled upon it one, light, one night last summer when I was searching for ideas. I immediately knew that I wanted to turn it into a piece of theater that would convey the importance of voting, not for the sake of the house, but for the sake of the people inside of it. I think the reason why I was so drawn to this poem is because it aims to find the humanity in all the noise and chaos we call politics. I wanted to transform it into a piece that talks about politics not in terms of systems and parties, but in terms of people, trying to figure out how we can best take care of one another. I wanted more of us to come to understand politics in this way and to see that inaction is an active choice that has consequences. I wanted us to feel inspired to make better choices for our children. And I wanted us to understand that our voices carry much more meaning than we think. Well, I skipped a slide, that's okay. 
While much of that still rings true today, I think a lot of my early passion for this project was fueled by frustration and impatience. With everything from my right to marry the person I love, to my safety in school, to my healthcare and autonomy, all on the chopping block every four years, I am often angry when others don't appear to share the same sense of urgency I feel when I think about politics. I always thought matters of voting and advocating for change to be as simple as well, if they wanted to, they would, which is why I went into this project thinking that my goal was to persuade the world to care. But the more I listen to people's stories and reasons for disengaging with politics, the more I realize that lack of voter turnout is almost never about apathy. Through conversations, articles, journals, and interviews, stories of Americans who feel drowned out or not listened to, I came to understand that we feel disconnected from our political system for very real reasons. The reasons for low participation are part of our lived experiences. And while some of this is due to the fact that our political system was specifically designed to be inaccessible with the intention of excluding women and people of color, much of it cannot be solved with new laws or policy changes. Even if voting were the easiest and most accessible thing in the world, turnout would not be any higher if we didn't see ourselves represented or believed our votes were worthless. This is the feeling that lies in the center of Strike Spark Ignite. How can we look the world in the eyes and still find the courage to hope? to believe that we can be seen and heard, that our voices make a difference, and that we have the power to create change. I believe that change is not always one more voice shouting from the rooftops. There is a time and place for that, of course, but change is also defined by how it appears on the everyday. I believe that change is making people feel seen and heard. It's conversation, it's listening, it's empowerment. It's moving forward with both understanding and accountability. That, above all else, is what my senior project aims to create. With my ideas and inspiration secured, I moved into writing. I have loved performing my entire life, but playwriting was very new to me at the start of this process. The last time I had attempted to write a play was when I was nine years old and had just discovered the Word app on my mom's iPad. I wrote two scenes of a musical about food. It's deeply, deeply terrible. My point being that playwriting was a side of theater making that I was almost entirely inexperienced in. And not only was I trying to learn how to do something new, that something was going to be put on stage in front of hundreds of people in just a few short months. This was a very vulnerable position, the result of which was that I could not stand to let my writing be bad. I felt as though I didn't have time to mess around with anything short of what would be good enough to perform on stage. I was terrified of exploring and experimenting. Even once I started writing, I restricted myself. I have always had a habit of editing my writing as I go. This works just fine for shorter academic writing or for something with a clearly understood course, but for something like a play, it is entirely unsustainable. I ended up, well, I ended up a lot like this guy. I found myself writing in circles, constantly moving back to change words and make small adjustments, trying to shape it into something I liked. The problem, however, is I wasn't learning anything new about my characters. My story was vague. It wasn't growing. I needed to allow myself to write the parts of the story I did not understand yet. 
After some much needed advice from my mom, I started writing again. This time with the goal of creating an imperfect but complete first draft. And don't get me wrong, it was bad. It was bad for a long time. One draft had zombies involved. Even I don't know exactly what was up with that version. But I was trying things, which meant I was learning. I had a direction to move in. Creating work I wasn't proud of definitely made me doubt myself at times. And there were many moments when I felt like I was never going to create something I was happy with. But I would take that feeling over the safe, non-specific writing I had been stuck with before. I've now come to believe that every single outline, rough draft, and garbled note to myself served a purpose. Even the most embarrassing early drafts reappeared in the most unexpected ways. One of the most satisfying moments of this entire process came when I realized that one of the very first scenes I wrote, and had since deleted, actually fit perfectly in a different part of the play. This kind of thing happened over and over again. I kept on returning to earlier drafts to extract lines and phrases that I liked. I soon realized that without all those imperfect stages, Strike, Spark, Ignite would not exist at all. Looking back, I see this play sort of like a person growing up, with all the hilarious, confusing, and occasionally cringe-worthy moments that shape who we become. Even though I look back on my childhood fashion choices with some embarrassment, I also understand that the lessons I learned in that time of my life are essential to the person I am today. And the same is true with art, because somewhere along the way, the bad becomes good, the uncertainty becomes clarity, and someday you can look back on it all with newfound perspective and finally understand that art, like all the rest of us, needs an awkward phase. Another huge takeaway from this part of the process is the importance of rest. I have a habit of prioritizing my work above all else, and I often forget to slow down and take care of myself and my health first. I remember one week that was particularly difficult. I had been sick for nearly a month. I was overexerting my voice and my body at long rehearsals for another show and working on my script in what little downtime I found. Looking back, I see that I was asking so much of myself, but at the time, I was terrified I wasn't doing enough. My mind felt sluggish and slow and stripped of inspiration. It felt like I couldn't produce anything even worth reading, let alone performing on stage. My confidence in myself and my work and ability plummeted. I met with my advisor, Ms. Wellington, that week and told her I was scared I wouldn't be able to finish. What she said to me after changed everything. Go home, rest, let your body heal, and then take this thing back. Do it for the right reasons. Let yourself enjoy it again, she said. Those words have stuck with me for the last few months, and I know they will for the rest of my life. Recognizing that I need rest in moments of frustration is nearly impossible for me, which is why hearing it from someone else meant so much to me in that moment. I was able to let go of all of the guilt and disappointment I had been feeling for the last month. And suddenly, I felt lighter than I had in weeks. I followed her advice. I went home that weekend and slept. I woke up late and with no expectations for the days ahead. I let myself have fun. I got better. I finished out my performances with so much joy and love in my heart. And then, on the following Monday, the impossible happened. I completed the first draft of my script, and what's more, it felt easy. Since that day, I've come to understand that resting, giving grace, and having fun are among the most productive things I can do for myself, 
and that finding ways to enjoy the simple work of creating art, removed from the stress of deadlines or whether or not it will be good enough, is absolutely essential to maintaining my energy and my will to keep working. I am also learning to meet myself where I am on any given day and allow myself to rest and recover when I need to. Okay, I sort of skimmed past this part to make my point, but I completed my first draft. This was where the fun part really began for me. I spent the next couple weeks editing and getting feedback from my incredible advisors, family, and friends. One thing about me is that I absolutely love the editing process. I revised over and over again, and the piece got stronger every day. These revisions finally transformed Strike, Spark, Ignite into the script I had imagined. The next step was to bring it to life on stage. With my script complete, I turned my attention to casting, which means finding actors to play the four characters. One of my biggest fears moving into this part of the process was being unable to find actors. I soon realized that I had no reason to worry. I sent out a casting call to all of my theater connections around the city. The response was unbelievable. By the next morning, over a dozen people had reached out to express their interest and support. To say I was thrilled would be an understatement. I was jumping up and down at 7 a.m. in the hotel bathroom, thrilled. A few days after I sent out my casting call, I hosted a table read to hear the dialogue out loud to help me make more edits. I invited my friends and a few teachers, not with the intention that any of them would be part of the final production. I was very mistaken. I absolutely fell in love with Miss Von Orthal's Diane. Her instincts for timing and inflections were perfect for the character. She effortlessly captured Diane's kindness and sense of humor. Not an hour after the reading, I approached her and asked if she wanted to take on the role in the real play. She said yes. A couple days later, I met with Sophia. She worked at Steppenwolf Theater with me and was one of the people who reached out to me online about being part of the project. They say, when you know, you know, and this was absolutely true for Sophia. I think she was about 20 seconds into reading for Ellie when I knew she was the one. She exuded such beautiful and authentic optimism and belief in others, which is key to Ellie's character. I offered her the part right then and there. Our entire Zoom meeting took seven minutes. Over the next couple weeks, I heard a couple amazing people read for Ziamara, but none of them quite had the fire and strength I had envisioned for the character. On the way home from hearing one such audition, I realized that the person I had been looking for had been right in front of me. Looking back, I feel like Jocelyn was always meant to be Ziamara because so much of my writing for the character was based on real conversations I had with her. She was my inspiration in so many ways, so it only felt right that she would be the one to bring this character to life on stage. I FaceTimed her as soon as I got home. She was just as excited as I was. At this time, I was still searching for an actor to play Blake. I told one of my theater teachers about the show and the role I was looking to fill. Her response was, quote, I know a guy. That night, she put me in touch with Will, another one of her students. We met that weekend. He was fantastic. He was so passionate about the message of the play and had the perfect balance of Blake's stubbornness and care in his reading. And with that, the show was fully cast. People who run marathons say there comes a moment in the race when you know you're going to finish. For some, this moment comes the second they set foot on the track, or even before. For others, it doesn't come until they take their last step over the finish line. This was that moment for me. 
And not only was I certain that this play would be everything I had hoped for, I knew these actors would transform it into something I never could have dreamed of. Our rehearsals together were by far the most rewarding moments of this entire project. I truly could not have asked for a more dedicated and talented cast. Together, we managed to put this show together in only five rehearsals. Our first rehearsal was a reading on Zoom. The cast didn't know each other before this play, so we took some time to get to know each other, talk about what books and shows we were loving, and start to connect as a group. We then read through the script together. The next rehearsal was for blocking, which means planning and learning the movement of a play. Putting the show on its feet in the theater was an absolute blast. I lost my place on the page. Hold up. <laughs> Putting the show on its feet in the theater and watching the actors perform it in person was an absolute blast. We also played games, ate snacks, and had a little photo shoot on the stage. The remaining rehearsals were for rehearsing the show and working trouble spots. Watching the show come to life during those weeks was so surreal. Being surrounded by artists who were all equally excited to put this show out into the world was gratifying and inspiring beyond words. The bravery, passion, imagination, and joy these actors brought to their characters and to the rehearsal room was absolutely beautiful. During this same time, I was also working on design elements, the logo art, costumes, sounds, set, and lighting. Fun fact, Strike Spark Ignite did not have a title until January. It was actually the need for logo, promotional art, and an invitation to the show that finally forced me to name the piece. I actually came up with the show's subtitle first, which then inspired the main title. Strike, spark, ignite. The fire inside us will send our walls crashing down or light our way to somewhere new. I liked the idea that it is within our power to stop, spread, or transform the fire into something new and beautiful. Here is the logo art for Strike, Spark, Ignite, created with help from my amazing mom. I drew the match digitally using Procreate, and then my mom helped me add the words on Adobe Illustrator. I created four costume boards on Pinterest for each of the four characters. These boards were my visions for the character's costume and aesthetics. I tried to encapsulate an overall feel rather than specific clothing items. I shared my design ideas with the cast and let them pull costumes from their own wardrobes. I really wanted the actors to decide how they think their characters would present themselves. Here you can see the design suggestions I gave them and the costumes they pulled from home. In addition to finding sound effects, I also created two sound montages to illustrate the characters' worlds at the beginning of the play compared to the end. The beginning is chaotic, loud, and violent. The end is hopeful. These montages were made from, made from audio, pulled from news reports, protests, speeches, and historical footage. I also incorporated the song We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel. Making the montages was pretty straightforward. I pulled audio from different places online, converted the files using the Cloud Convert website, which I spent way too much time on, and layered all the audio together in GarageBand. The huge design project was, of course, the set, which you have seen outside in the art installation. My family and I built the entire set in our backyard, starting with nothing but this model of the frame. My vision for the set was a frame of a boarded up house covered in newspapers, photos, posters, and flames. 
We created the frame with one by fours and attached it together with nuts and bolts. We had to spread the process out over several days because the January weather was not doing us any favors. We also ran into some trouble with stability. Houses have four walls for a reason, y'all. Uh, trying to build one with two was very tricky. We ended up attaching a couple of trusses and a triangular support to keep the walls from leaning, which worked great. The finished frame looked like this. Next, we had to bring the frame into the theater. We rented a U-Haul, loaded up the pieces, and brought them here where we reassembled them on stage. After we got the set into the space, we moved into decorating. We printed dozens of newspapers, photos, and documents to tell a story of American history and voting. We pulled protest signs and advertisements of votes for women's sash and American flags. We made cardboard cutouts of the White House, the Capitol, and the Statue of Liberty. We even added a couple photos of Tiny Me in Washington, D.C. We also added a framed copy of the poem, Voting as Fire Extinguisher. We stapled the netting onto the back of the frame and began attaching the papers. Covering the walls was pretty fun. It was like a giant collage. This is what the mostly covered walls looked like. The last part of the set that needed to be made was the fire. I made each of the flames by hand, I shaped the outlines with wire, and then covered the wire in red, orange, and yellow cellophane. Mr. Estep, if you're curious why I didn't read the end of the Bhagavad Gita, it's because I was making cellophane fire on my kitchen floor at 11 p.m. I hope that clears everything up. <laughs> this is what the finished set looked like. I'm so proud of this work of art, and I'm so grateful to my family for helping put it together. The last design element was lighting. I had ideas for lights written into the script all the way back to the earliest drafts. Each character in the play is represented by a different color, and the colors blend and merge as the show progresses. There is also a light cue to represent the breaking of the fourth wall, when the characters on stage see the audience for the first time. I worked with Michael McCarthy to design and program the lights. I was so happy with the lights, they made the show look so polished and complete, like the show I had been imagining since the summer. Incorporating all of the design elements during tech rehearsals was so fun. I had so much fun watching the show come together in tech. On our final day of rehearsal, we had the incredible Barry Baskin from Time Stops Photography come to take pictures. All of the onstage photos you've seen so far are her work, as are all of these. This brings me to the moment you've all been waiting for, the final stage of the project, the performance. I don't think any words can do these incredible actors' performance justice. I really wanted to play you some sections from the show, but unfortunately, the recording and the auditorium sound system do not agree, and every time we tried to play it, all the actors sounded like Darth Vader. So, <laughs> I would really encourage those of you who weren't able to come to the show to check out my art installation. There, you will find a QR code that will take you to a full video. You can also search either my name or the title Strike Spark Ignite on YouTube, the sound should be totally fine through a phone or computer. My script is also displayed with my art installation for anyone interested in reading it. Also at my art installation is a page of resources, instructions for registering to vote, organizations to, dedicated to getting out the vote, and more. I want to leave you all with one more story. About two months ago, my dad and I started building my set. We had a model that we planned to build from, but it soon became clear that some of the proportions would be problematic later. Eventually, we made the decision to scrap my original dimensions for the set and build the whole thing as we went. 
In a moment of exasperation and frustration, I commented that almost no part of my project had gone according to plan. My dad replied, well, that's what's supposed to happen. Plans change. Besides, if you had built that thing according to your original plan, you would have hated it, right? So it's good that we're doing it this way. He was right. And the more I look back on this process and compare it to what I thought it would be like, the more I see so. I spent hours brainstorming lists of topics and deliberating with my parents and advisors, but in the end, I got my idea for my senior project on my mom's friend's Instagram post. I planned time to write at the library, free of distractions, but if I had to make a chart of all the places I did the most writing, it would probably be at least 20% middle of nowhere West Virginia, 15% my bathroom floor, and 10% the hallway outside the Devonshire Cultural Center. I made a detailed scale model of my set only to throw it out and build the whole thing intuitively. Much like the characters in the play, I started out with feelings of fear and frustration and found my way to hope and confidence. Almost nothing about this process has been what I expected or once considered ideal, and yet I wouldn't have it any other way. I understand now that my dozens of timelines changed, outlines altered, ideas rejected, lines scrapped, scenes rewritten, and plans canceled were not failures. They were necessary adjustments to create something that I was truly happy with and proud of. Realizing this has shown me the importance of tackling changes and setbacks as they come, and trusting that even though my path may not be linear, I am still on my way, and I will still get there. To the juniors that are about to start their projects, I really hope you remember this. Your process will likely look very different from your friends, and that's okay. Don't hold yourself back. Explore, experiment, follow the path that feels right in your heart, work hard, fail over and over again, and I promise you, you will create something you are proud of. And even if you can't see it in the moment, every challenge is bringing you closer to where you want to be. Focus on the next step in front of you and trust that you are exactly where you need to be. You are all capable of incredible things, and I cannot wait to see what you do next year. Thanks. <laughs> now, I know you are all anxious to get out of those seats that definitely don't make your butt hurt, but before you do, I have some thank yous. First, I want to thank Kyle Tran Meyer for the poem that inspired this whole project and to Rose Brock for sharing it with me. I want to thank Cynthia, Will, Sophia, and Jocelyn, the incredible team of actors that brought this show to life. I want to thank Michael, who is the outstanding light technician, sound and light technician for Strike Sparking Night. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank my senior project advisor, Ms. Wellington, for all of her generous help and support. I want to thank my writing advisor, Mr. Estep, for helping with my journal. I want to thank Barry for capturing the show so beautifully. I want to thank Janae for making the delicious cookies for the reception, which we are all huge fans of. I want to thank everyone who has inspired and supported this project, my class, my friends, my teachers, my class sponsors, my Aunt Renee, and everyone who came to see the show. 
I want to thank Ursula for being the best friend, life partner, and endless source of love and inspiration I could ask for. And lastly, I want to thank my parents for all their help and support, the hours they put in to make this project a reality, and for always being there for me. Theater truly does take a village, and I'm so lucky to be surrounded by such kind, smart, passionate, and dedicated people. I love you all so much. Thank you. Well, this is only appropriate. <laughs> Great job, Ari. You should be so proud. Thank um, you. I was wondering if you could talk more about how you involve the voters' apathy and oppression in the play, like through the characters and stuff. Yes. Um, so in my early research for this project, I learned a whole lot about voter suppression. And that was something I sort of wanted to incorporate in the play to uh, sort of help complete this picture and um, find empathy. Um, so that is definitely something that two of the characters in particular are grappling with, um, whether it's just accessibility of, well, the closest polling place is like 30 minutes in traffic or has a line and I don't have time off work, things like that, and really bringing those things to the surface and having conversations about that. And also having the characters arrive at sort of this realization that the only way to make voting more accessible is to do it anyways. And to get out there and vote and vote for people who are trying to make it more accessible instead of less. And talking about voting even in communities where it's not really talked about. So. Um, so I was wondering, it's, there were a couple things, but like, if, I would obviously vote for you for president, um, <laughs> and what do you think would be the first thing you would do if you were the president to, that you feel would help to do the most in our climate right now? I got bad news. I do not want to run for president, but... <laughs> I'm not um, asking you to run for president, but I'm wondering if you've thought about that. Like, what is something that you feel um, would do us the most good in this country? Whew. Um, <laughs> you don't have to have an answer. Give me three hours. I can come back to you. <laughs> um, <sighs> um, I think... There's so much. Yeah. Um, I can give back to you if you really okay. want to know. <laughs> my, my other thing, I quickly, um, um, and it may be a dumb question because obviously, I mean, you've said so much to us and so much good advice and you, um, this play, everything seems like it's an output of where you come from. but. When you feel that level, like a li that hopelessness or that feeling like, oh, you know, what could I do? Is there somewhere you go, the first thing you say to yourself, is there something you do right away to help you move through that feeling? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of my support and my like sort of fire and energy really does come from my mom. So uh, I would go to her and I also think back, um, I, in 2016, after the presidential election, um, well even before then, um, I remember being so, so excited to have a woman for president. And my, like, my best friend and I, we had like a sleepover and we like made snacks and we were all like, yes, this is like, this is it. Women can do everything. And I just remember being so crushed after, after that election. And I think I go back to that place a lot. And it's just sort of this idea of 
doing it for that little 10-year-old that wanted a woman for president. Amazing job. This whole process was very admirable. Um, I was wondering, did you ever consider acting in the play yourself? Um, I did not. I had like a little brief moment of panic that was like, what if I can't find people and I have to be in it? But that was two seconds in like the grand scheme of things. And um, these actors are incredible. And I, yeah, there's, there was never really a moment um, where I would change it. And also, it's very hard to direct a show you're in. So there was also this question if like I'm in it, then who directs it? So yeah, no, not really. <laughs> Can I just um, add on to that, to Bailey's question? What did you learn about acting and actors <laughs> from being the director? Check your email. <laughs> um, um, no, seriously, I, um, when you're an actor, you don't really understand like, oh, my director emailed me two days ago. I can like get, probably answer tomorrow. No, we are like clutching our computers. Like, when are we gonna schedule this? When am I gonna hear back? So yes, that was definitely, um, my takeaway is the importance of being on time, of um, responding quickly, and really doing the work um, in a timely manner because it makes our jobs as directors so much easier and so much more fun. Um, wonderful job. Yeah, wonderful, Hi. great. Um, you spoke about this poem being an inspiration to you, and I'm just wondering if there have been plays or playwrights that have also had an impact on you, either by their writing style or their messages in some way pushed you in this direction? Yeah, um, I think um, What the Constitution Means to Me and Roe were two plays that I saw that sort of showed me um, like political theater as a concept. Um, there was also this book that um, one of my co-directors gifted me. It was called Theater of the Oppressed and it's about political theater and the history theater has in making an impact on the world and society and our government. And all of those things were really inspiring to me as far as like creating work that speaks to people in this way. Um, I also, when I was like in the trenches of write, the writing process, I went to go see Sanctuary City at Steppenwolf, and they, there was this sort of style, it, the play jumps through time, and it's sort of little pieces of dialogue that all layer together, and I was at this point where three of the characters had a monologue all separately, and I wanted them to come together in some way. And I sort of realized, oh, that's it. That's how I do it. And I took little pieces of their stories and layered them together and had people speaking at the same time for experiences that they shared. And that sort of like style was like immensely helpful. It like dug me out of the hole I had put myself in. Yes. Um, like, do you have a favorite play or a favorite play writer? Ooh. Um, I think I'm mostly a musical theater person, um, like by training, so I have been to a lot of musicals. I think mm, my favorite show has got to be Hades Town. It's, um, it's like a blend of Greek myths. It's fantastic. There's like a live band on stage. Even my dad loved it. It was phenomenal. So, yes. <laughs> Arwen, what do you think makes theater particularly suited, as opposed to film or another um, entertainment medium? Uh, what, what does it make? What is what makes theater so particularly suited to delivering a call to action? Yeah, um, in my opinion, there's just something so special about being in a room with people and hearing them speak, breathing the same air as them that just tangible feeling that you can't get anywhere else. And um, to use the film example, um, film is also phenomenal, but you are still in your own world. But with theater, you come together, you're in a room full of people all sharing the story at once, 
and um, you're in the moment not just with the other audience members, but also with the actors. And I think there's something just so powerful about that. All right. Uh, Where are we? Here, hello. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, first of all, love your presentation. Love your play. Uh, what was I going to say? Right. Uh, <laughs> so we, OK, so there are midterm elections. There are, uh, there's the presidential election. And we elect people for our city, for our county, for our state, our yes. aldermen. So how, how do you think that when we go to vote and we see all those names on the ballot, how do you think that the lay person who's not politically involved can uh, determine for themselves who they should vote and who is most in line with their uh, beliefs? Great question. Um, I think for someone who doesn't want to you know, do all the research, like spend hours in front of a computer trying to figure out like who is saying the right things, I think turning to your community is a great way. And particularly, I said this at the play in the Q&A, turning to the people who are most impacted, turn to the women in your lives, the people of color, the immigrants, the people who, whose lives hang in the balance. And follow them where they go, follow them as they fight for their rights, for their, um, can't think of another word, but yes. <laughs> oh, so, all right, so I got a question. So are you gonna take this play further than Waldor? Because honestly, when I saw this play, I gotta admit, it was nothing short than phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I have had a few people um, whisper, there have been whispers about maybe potentially publishing it in the future. Um, that is something that I wanna do. Um, as far as doing more like physical productions of it, I'm not sure. Um, I think your project was really effective and I applaud you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wonder if you know the history of the school 50 years ago, some of the very early, early teachers and founders, one was a member of the White Rose Resistance Group in Germany. They were just students in college and they were so threatening the, the Nazis that they were rounded up and some of them were killed, but she wasn't luckily and she loved Eurythmy and performed it till she was in her 60s here in Chicago started the Esperanza School, Trouda Page was her name. And then two of the um, two families, early founders of the school, one um, family walked across the bridge in Selma with John Lewis for voting rights, and the other defended the Chicago Seven. So I don't, you're building on all of that, and I'm just really happy. <laughs> Thank you so much, that's like really fascinating history. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. All right. Oh, and fantastic job. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, what a great way to finish this week with Arwen. Thank you. Congratulations. And thank you. We are quite not done. We don't want to finish this great, great week. Can I call Ms. Beefis also here on stage? So first of all, uh, we want to ask our dear seniors to come up on stage one more time. All of them. Yes, yes, that's what I, we were going to ask all of you. One more round of applause to these 16 students. You all did a great job. You taught us so much, all of us. And um, we know that uh, Mr. McCarthy, at the beginning of the day, he, he gave some thank yous, but why not to give more thank yous, right? So right now, we will ask if you're here 
in the auditorium to those senior project advisors to stand up, please, right now. And then I'll mention before, but just once again on behalf of the class, a long list of people have been helping. So Colin Williams and Audible Sound, John Huchtel, Michael McCarthy, Ms. Van Orthel, Ms. Wellington, Ms. Gifar, Ms. McCann, and all the 12th grade parents. One more big round of applause. There has been like a competition here of the clapping, right? In the uh, tenth grade. Thank you. <laughs> and we will then have a competition. On behalf of my class, we want to give a special shout out to the grade school. You guys have been such great listeners and shown a lot of interest this whole week. You made this whole week just feel really special. Thank you for your like dedication for, to us. One last message that we will say before we let you all go is the first grade class and their families warmly invite the 12th grade students and their sponsors for lunch in the cafe to celebrate this week. So can we give also a round of applause to the first grade families? <laughs> and thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you.